Lord, we thank you that we can come into your house with thanksgiving and praise. We thank you that we can come in your house and be with you, to fellowship with you, to exalt and honor you. But Father, we're even thankful that we can be in your house together with the brethren, with one another. We're thankful for the giftings and the talents and the anointing uh, that you've placed on the people's lives all over this uh, campus, all over this facility. There are people who are exercising the gifting and calling and grace that you've given them from security to ushering, the audio, the video, the presentation, the ushers, the, the children's ministers. They're all functioning, the worship team, ministering unto the Lord in bringing the gifting into the house of God to bring glory and honor and praise to your name. This is a great day to be alive, and it's an awesome day to be found in your house. Thank you that we can come together to this place, consecrated, set apart, holy unto you. Father, we look to you now in Jesus' name. We ask that the Holy Spirit of God, that is the author and the teacher of this book, would open up our eyes, cause us to see what it is you're trying to show us, Open up our ears, Holy Spirit. Help us to hear what it is the Father is saying to us. And we'll give you glory and honor and praise for it. We'll thank you in advance for wisdom and revelation. We'll thank you in advance for impartation. We'll thank you in advance for the understanding. We'll thank you in advance for the life change. We'll thank you in advance for the opportunity for us to go out of these doors, mix faith and action with the word that we've heard, and watch it work. We give you glory and honor and praise in advance. That's what faith does. We give you glory before we even walk through the situation. We give you praise before we ever get to the end. We know that today you'll speak to us. We thank you for it, and we rejoice in it. In Jesus' name, if you agree with that, say amen. amen. Praise God. Well, this morning we're going to continue along the lines of having... Uh, an excellent spirit. Last Sunday, we opened up this uh, sermon series. We talked about Daniel. We talked about his three friends. We talked about how Nebuchadnezzar had taken them captive from their homeland, from their people, from their God, and taken them into captivity in Babylon. We found that they changed the names of all four of those Hebrew men, and that those names were moved from Jehovah is judge, and Jehovah is my helper, and Jehovah, and they changed it to worship or to mean uh, false gods of the Babylonians. The Chaldeans had different gods, of course, than our God, and so the enemy, we said, comes to try to steal your identity. And it doesn't matter what you may be facing today. It doesn't matter what you may be facing tomorrow. And that doesn't mean that no one cares. When we say it doesn't matter, what we mean is that there's nothing impossible for our God. There's nothing too difficult for our God. And no matter what it is that you're facing, God has promised that he'll walk us through it in victory. Amen. And so whatever you may be facing today, whatever failure, whatever problem, whatever obstacle, whatever challenge, whatever issue, whatever fear, don't let the enemy whisper to you like he did to Jesus. Don't let the enemy whisper to you like he did to Adam and Eve in the garden. Don't let him whisper to you that you're not who God says that you are, that you can't do what God said you can do, and you can't have what God said you can have. Praise God. We understand the enemy's going to come to attack our identity, but he has no place in us. Three of you agree with that. I said he has no place in us unless we give him a place. Raise your hand if you want to give the devil place today. You're pretty smart. Amen. He is, the, he is the proverbial give him an inch and he'll take ten miles, right? Then we talked on Wednesday night. You know we have church on midweek? I wasn't sure you knew, but we do. It's really, it's really neat. Praise God. Wanted to make sure you understood that just in case. You know, some of you have been here for about you know, ten years. But we have church on Wednesday night. Praise God. Anyway, on Wednesday, on Wednesday night, uh, we talked about how even if you're in, literally, imprisoned. The Spirit of God was speaking to Saul of Tarsus, the Spirit of God, now with Paul, and Silas telling them to go uh, and wait until he bid them directions for them to go. The book of Acts tells us in Acts chapter 16, then in the middle of the night, Paul woke up and had a vision, saw a man from Macedonia pleading in this vision, come over here and help us. So immediately, Paul and Silas and the team got up in obedience to that heavenly vision that they had received in the night. 
They find themselves in that area, and they begin to go into prayer. They begin to go and do what their custom was, to go to the house of God and to be found among the people of God. And then the Bible tells us that there is a little girl who is possessed by a devil and had a spirit of divination, and she made her uh, owners, because she was enslaved to them, she made those who owned her uh, no small profit. They were making all kinds of money off of her ability, demonically, to be able to predict and give them a, f a fortune and tell them uh, these things that, that she was seeing uh, by the holy, uh, excuse me, by, by, the, by the evil spirit that was in possessing her. And by the Holy Spirit, Paul says, after being this uh, happening many days, he was greatly annoyed and he turned and said to the spirit. He didn't yell at the person. And so first thing we found out on Wednesday is people are not our problem. Even if they are crazy, look at your neighbor and say, you're not my problem. Look at your other neighbor and say, you might be. No, don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. Praise God, we're going to split this church wide open. I'll teach you who to sit next to next time, just in case. I'm, a, I'm on purpose set by the people I don't like in case I get that opportunity again. But people aren't our problem. The devil's our problem. Amen. I don't know if you ever have known this name or heard this name. But uh, great ministry, man of God, uh, evangelist, Norval Hayes. Anybody ever heard of Norval Hayes? Norval Hayes went on to be with the Lord. He's in his reward now. But if you ever heard Norval Hayes preach, you, your butt went numb. Because he preached like three and a half hours. And uh, he's just a different fella. But he'd stand up in the pulpit and he'd say, The devil make you crazy, crazy. The devil's crazy. He'll make you crazy. Anyway, <laughs> Google it. But uh, the devil is crazy. And people might be acting crazy, but they're not our problem. This little girl wasn't Paul's problem. Paul didn't turn to this little girl and say, you little turd, get out of my life. Leave me alone. But what he did, greatly annoyed because this happened many days in a row, moving right along for the sake of the clock marching, he greatly annoyed, turned to the spirit and said, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. Come out of that girl. Well, when that happened, those people who owned her were not happy about it at all. Why? Because they lost their ability to profit off of her. Because now uh, the lights were on, but no one was home, and there's not the ability to be able to give these demonic, as it were, readings any longer. And so the Bible tells us that they rose up, and they went to the magistrates and said, you guys have to do something about these guys. They're coming and preaching a different message to us. And they're telling us things and customs that we don't adhere to because we're Romans. And so the Bible tells us, as you, as you may know, uh, that the magistrates got to them and ripped the clothes off of them so they're in public and naked. And then they began to, to beat them with rods. And uh, there are di different ideas about beating with rods. One is that they would actually take this rod and hit you across the back of your rib cage around the side so it would fracture your ribs so you couldn't breathe. The other one's actually worse than that, believe it or not. They would take these rods and they would beat the feet of the people who were being abused by them to the point that their feet were deformed. Now think about that and then make them stand all day long and stand trial, stand in shame, stand naked, and have to stand on their feet. I'd take the cracked rib if I had to, I think, because, man, I'll tell you what, after a certain amount of time, even if your feet aren't beat up and deformed, it hurts to stand, right? Lose some weight, fatty. That was to me, not to you. <laughs> your, feet, your feet don't don't hurt, neither do mine, praise God. So anyway, what we saw in that text was, after having this public mockery, public shaming, torment coming to them, by the magistrates, all they were doing, don't forget, don't lose sight, all they were doing was obeying the Spirit of God. That's all they did. And so I asked this question on Wednesday, how many of you can say, I remember a time in my life when I flat out obeyed the Spirit of God and all hell came against me. No one? Just me? No, that can't be the case, right? And so what ends up happening is they have this public shaming. They're stripped naked in the streets. They're beaten with rods. Many 
rods. They're taken into jail. The Philippian jailer is given charge over them. Don't you lose them. Don't let anybody come to them. Don't let anything bad happen to them. If it is, your head is going to be on the cutting block. And so he takes them, given, been giving that assignment, uh, into an inner dungeon. So they're now in what many believe, and we don't know this 100% for sure, but many believe that they were in an inner dungeon where the sewer of the city ran through. So that's neat. That's a bad Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday. And so they're in this inner dungeon. And the Bible tells us that at midnight, what does midnight mean to you? Middle of the night. After facing everything they faced and being beaten and, and embarrassed and mocked and shamed publicly, and arrested and put in chains at midnight, the Bible says that they began to sing praise to God. And as we said on Wednesday, many of us in this room know the end of that story. We know what ends up happening, that God answers and responds to their worship and responds to their praise. They weren't saying, oh God, get us out of here. They were simply glorifying Him. Many believe that they were chanting uh, the Psalms, as they had been taught, no doubt, when they were children, as Paul had mastered and learned by memorization the entire first four or five books of the law. And so they're not saying, God, get us out of here. Why is this happening to me? It's not fair. All I did was obey you. They're not belly aching and whining and complaining. They're singing, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. How tough is your problem again? Don't look at me in that tone of voice. I'll stare right back at you. Ariana was staring at me on Friday night out in the chapel. Seth and Jess were here with their babies. And Ariana was just standing there staring at me. And neither of us blinked for a while. I'll tell you, she gave me a run for my money. But I told her, I said, dear, I'm a professional starer. You're going down. And I'll whoop that little two-year-old right into submission. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> but at midnight, they begin to praise God, and they begin to sing glories to God. And in the text, a very, very powerful statement is made. And I think often the body of Christ just skims over. But the Bible says that those who were in prison heard them. And so I asked the crowd on Wednesday night, how many times have you had a rough go of it? How many times have you had a disappointing day or a disappointing outcome to something that you were planning or wanting to do and it didn't quite go the way that you wanted to and then on Monday morning you were at the water cooler complaining about things instead of out loud, intentionally, on purpose, just singing praises to God. The excellent spirit, the right heart, or the right attitude, will even in the stock and bond, even in the inner dungeon, even after being tormented and mocked, and even after being punished and beat, the excellent spirit will say, it doesn't matter what I face. It doesn't matter what I go through. God is still exalted above everything else. He's still on the throne. He's still working on my behalf. And there are prisoners who are around you every day of your life, and they're listening to what's coming out of your mouth. They're hearing, they're hearing you complain about your, your co-workers. And they're wondering, why are you gossiping? Aren't you not supposed to gossip? It's got awful quiet in this Holy Ghost, pew-jumping, chandelier-swinging church. Dr. Billy Graham had told this story many times in his life, and there's a bit of debate as to its origin. We do know that it's true. We do know that it happened. We don't know who reported it first. I heard it from Dr. Billy Graham, and then I Googled it. There was a man who was a notorious criminal and was about to be put to death. And the priest came at the call of the executioner and the local government and said, come and 
read this man, his last rites. He's about to go to the execution block. He's going to hang or get his head cut off or whatever. So the priest comes and he talks to him and he says that without Christ, there is only hell forever. And even you, no matter what you've done, murder, rape, whatever, you can be forgiven. Jesus will forgive you. It doesn't matter what you've done. The blood of Jesus Christ can wash away any stain that sin has left on the garment of your life. And if you just simply receive him, even in this moment, right at the end of your life, you'll be able to escape eternal damnation and come into everlasting life and be with God and be in heaven and live forever in his glory as opposed to living forever in his torment. Satan's, excuse me, torment. God did not create hell for humans. He created hell for Satan. And the story goes that the man responds back to the priest who's about to be killed. And he says this statement to the priest. I don't believe that. I don't believe that's true. I've been shared that story before. It's been communicated to me before. I didn't believe it then. I don't believe it now. But one thing I know, I don't think you believe it. Now, this is a true account. This happened. And the priest had to take a step back and gain some composure because he probably wanted to do the execution for him, right? You don't believe what you just said. You're a hypocrite. You're a liar. You don't believe it. And so finally the priest says, well, say on. What do you, what do you mean I don't believe it? He said, well, I, I don't believe in Jesus Christ. But I can tell that you don't believe in Jesus Christ. And he said, furthermore, I don't think that the church believes what you just said. And so this famous statement is this man on his literal deathbed, he's about to be executed, said, if I were to believe it, and if you really were to believe it, if the earth were broken shards of glass, I would crawl on my hands and knees to tell people that story. But see, the church doesn't believe it because every day goes by and no one cares too busy trying to figure out what's going on in their life because some preacher somewhere wrote a book and said you can have your best life now and so we've gotten so self-centered self-serving that we forgot that there's a time in our life where we may actually have to let go of what we want to do for the sake of the cause and for the sake of the cross and for the sake of the lost for the sake of the world and so he said if the earth were covered with broken shards of glass you'd crawl on your hands and knees to tell everyone in it what you just said to me i can tell you don't believe it why are you bringing that up when you're talking about an excellent spirit because people are watching you and they're imprisoned they want to look to you and see mr candlestick maker mr banker mr you fill in the blank or mrs whatever it is you do they want to see they're watching from afar from their prison cell. They want to see, do you believe the things that you pretend to believe? Worse yet, do you only believe those things on Sunday morning because you're a hypocrite? Are you living out the life that God has given you to live? Or are you on Monday morning no different than everyone else in the office? Many Christians, and I know because I've worked with them, this is a sad statement. It's an indictment against the body of Christ. I'd rather, most of the time, I'd rather work with heathens than Christians. Because I found that most heathens won't run you in the back when you're not looking. But a lot of Christians will do it as fast as they have an opportunity. I don't like that. I don't like what they said. I don't like how that preacher was preaching. I don't like their worship. I didn't like, it's like, shut up. We didn't do it for you. At no point this morning did we decide, we'll sing this song because they'll like it. We decided, Nick and Mandy, decided to sing the songs they sang because they thought, God's probably going to like these songs. Amen. 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 But anyway, is there any difference between us? They're looking from their prison cell. They're watching and they're looking and they're saying, that person's miserable. 
I'm miserable. I'm already miserable without having what they have, and it doesn't even cost me 10%. They complain about having to give 10%, and they're still miserable. You didn't like this part of the message. From prison, what are you doing? Now, you are let out of the cage. You're not a prisoner any longer. When you're out and about near people in prison, they're listening and watching what you're doing and saying. And they want to see, do you have character and integrity? Did anything change? Did anything change in your life? Pastor Dana preached a message uh, the last time she ministered. She talked about first what happens is Jesus is revealed to us. And we say, oh my God, I'm undone. I must be born again. I'm, I'm a sinner. I need to be forgiven. I need to be saved. Jesus is revealed to us. And then, through a process of growth and change in discipleship, Jesus is revealed in us. We begin to act different and talk different. It's not behavioral modification. It's just the heart cry and desire changes and shifts to something else. We begin to pursue God instead of whatever else we were pursuing before. You fill in the blank. So Christ is not just revealed to us. He begins to be revealed in us, which, by the way, is the reason that God doesn't give everyone a personal rapture when they receive him. Because he wants the world to see that Christ in you is the hope of glory. That's the mystery, Paul said to the church in Colossae, that's been hidden from the beginning of the world. It's Christ that's in the human. It's the hope of glory. And so the process of growth and change is Christ begins to re be revealed through us. What I mean by that is in us. People can see you're different. I don't, I can't put a finger on it, but I haven't seen you in a few months and you seem happy. You don't seem to be as discouraged or depressed or as overwhelmed as you used to be. And then they ask, what happened? And then we simply say, I'm in a man named Jesus and he changed me. Leading people to Jesus is really easy. It's really easy. The devil tries to tell you it isn't. But it's really, really easy. Because all you got to do is just open up your mouth. Everything I was that I hated about me, I'm not anymore. Why? Because I met a man named Jesus, and he made me what I am today. And I'm not perfect, but I'm changed. Anyway, so we want to make sure that we're not, we'll, we'll move along because you're not as happy. You're a little fussy this morning. Nick's going to go and get you a bottle if you're not careful. <laughs> Wasn't that powerful what the Holy Spirit gave him? Boy, I'll tell you what. That's a, that's a picture that everybody can pick up. And if, if you're not blessed with children yet, just wait. <laughs> You'll understand. Like, I don't have 17 arms. I wish that I had more hands. Anyway. Even if you're in jail, you can still say praise to God. You can still sing glory to God, even though it's hard, even though it hurts. You can still make a decision. I'm going to have an excellent spirit in this. It's not going to break me. I won't be easily moved. I won't be easily broken. I won't be easily uh, pushed off course. I'm going to be steadfast. I'm going to be immovable. I'm always going to abound in the work of the Lord. That's a New Testament verse that most Christians don't know. Because the first sight of trouble, I can't go to church today. No, always abound in the work of the Lord. Just because something's going bad, don't take it out on the church. They didn't do anything. Just because something's going bad, don't take it out on God. He didn't do anything. Be steadfast. Be immovable. Abound in the work of the Lord. That's an excellent spirit. Amen. Are you getting anything out of this? So then I was thinking, you know, we have these examples. We have the examples of, of Joseph. We have the examples of David. We have the examples of Moses. We have the examples, of course, of Daniel. We have the examples of others who went and did something with an excellent spirit that, that changed everybody's tomorrows forever. Think about Nehemiah and the fact that the children of God, the people of God, were just broken. Their, their whole entire morale was crushed. They had just come out of exile, some of them, and they went back and said, my God, it's all destroyed. They ruined it all. My Lord, look at this place. 
And so Nehemiah, a cupbearer. You know what a modern day, and you probably be offended by this, and that's okay. You know what a modern day translation of a cupbearer is? It's a bartender. He poured wine in the cups, in the king's cup. They didn't drink water because it wasn't purified. They drank wine. He was a barkeeper. He was a cupbearer. It was his responsibility to make sure whenever the king's around, he has what he wants to drink, and he has enough of it, and never goes dry. That's what his job was. So a bartender, a wine pourer, a cup bearer, was used by God because he had an excellent spirit. But thinking about these great men of God, and there's women of God in the Bible that you can track their lives. You think about Esther, and you think about Ruth, and you think about, and you can just keep going on and on and on and on, thinking about these great men and women of God who had an excellent spirit. Now, the Bible only records that Daniel had an excellent spirit, but we can see that excellent spirit showing up in others' lives. And as I was thinking about Moses and Joseph and David, and I was thinking about Daniel, and I was thinking about all those that I just mentioned, I thought, you know, there's one difference between us and them. Really. I mean, you can boil it down and say, well, you know, I'm not a man, or I'm not a woman, or I'm not a Hebrew, and I, did, I wasn't born back in 600 B.C. I get all those differences, but when you boil it all back down to, obviously, time and gender is going to be different, and most of you aren't sheep keepers. I get that. But in reality, the difference is, is that they did what they did, and they got the results that they got. And many of us don't do what they did, and so we don't get the results that they got. And really, that's just it. That's just how easy it can be. And you say, no, Pastor Brian, you don't understand what I've been through. Probably do. Probably been through it myself. Maybe even been through it worse. No, no, no. You don't understand what it's like to, yes, I do. I understand. And even if I haven't experienced it personally, I've been around people for a really long time, 42 years. Most of those years, I've been in God's house watching people, seeing terrible things happen. Really, the difference is, is that we can possess and maintain an excellent spirit, and we can do what these did and get the results that they received. In other words, you maybe have heard me say this before, if you want a Bible result, you have to do the Bible. If you want the results that you see in the Bible, you have to do what they did in the Bible. Isn't Christianity easy? It's not even hard. The wisdom of God is clothed in simplicity. It's wrapped up in simplicity that it's really that easy. I just read this book and like they did, I believe the God that they believed. And I'm not easily moved or shaken. I'm not easily picked up and carried away. I'm going to be immovable and always abound in the work of the Lord. And if I can do that, then I can have the Bible results. Paul says by the Holy Spirit, that's the reason these things were written down. That's why they're there. They're not just there so you can tell your kids crazy bed stories at nighttime. Come here, son. I want to tell you about the time when the man of God said that you're going to be dog poop after the dogs eat you. That's an awesome story, and I love it. I've led out with those at bedtime many times. If you're not careful, I'll feed you to a dog. You're, you're going to be Noah poop all over the yard. Some of you are offended. Just read your Bible. If we do what the Bible did, if we stand like those great men and women of God stood, then we can have it. The first thing that we have to do is say, no matter what it costs me, I'm going to keep a right attitude. I'm going to have an excellent spirit. I don't care if someone parked in my spot. I don't care if someone wore it better than me. I don't care if someone, and I'm talking about you ladies, check me out, I'm wearing it better than you. I don't care if they sat in my seat. I don't care if they didn't say hi to me. You know, the Bible says perfect peace have those who love God's word. 
The actual verse says thy law, but in reality it's God's words. Let me ask you a question. In the words of my pastor, Dr. Mark T. Barclay, how you doing with that? How you doing with perfect peace? How's that working out in your life? Maybe you have perfect peace. Maybe in all things, no one thing is missing and no one thing is broken, which is one transliteration or definition of the word peace. Maybe it's not. That doesn't mean that you're a failure. It doesn't mean that you're a loser. It doesn't mean that you should just tuck your tail between your legs and walk away and your head down in shame. What it means is if I don't possess perfect peace, there's hope for me. What it means is if I'm not walking in this excellent spirit, then there's room for me to change. There's room for me to grow. They say, Zig Ziglar was probably the one who was famous for quoting this. He was a motivational speaker, but he was also a Christian man. But Zig Ziglar said that one, of definition, one of the definitions of insanity is to do the same thing over and over and over again, but each time expect a different result. That doesn't make any sense. That's not how that works. That's not what happens. If you do the same thing that you're doing right now tomorrow, if you do the same thing tomorrow you did today, chances are super high you're going to get the same results. If you change or alter one thing, just one step, one attitude, just once, instead of falling apart and crumbling into an emotional mess of bricks and mortar. Just once, say, I'm not going to react to that. I was so happy. I don't see my mom. I'm sure, hi, mom. I like it when my mom comes to church. Doesn't happen that often, but praise God, she can darken the, she can darken the doors of the church every once in a while. Of course, it's because Tom drags her here. But anyway, <laughs> yesterday I was talking to mom, and she said something, and I said, oh, my God, freeze, stop the press. My mom is listening to my sermons. <laughs> because she said, you know, what we need to do is just learn to respond instead of react. I was like, yes! Just once, when everything comes up against me and all the right buttons are pushed, instead of flying off the handle, I'm just going to... <sighs> you're not going to get me today. You're not going to get me today. You might get me tomorrow, but you're not going to get me today. You're not going to get me today. Miss Rosie's saying, shh, just don't say anything. Just don't talk. Just shut up. Just keep your peace. That's, this is what we need to do. If we want to live these lives that we see recorded in the Bible, and I'm talking about the good ones, we don't want to have our fate be like Jezebel. That's the dog poop version. <laughs> the man literally said the women's lib would get a hold of this and just run it through the... I mean, I'm telling you, they'd hate, they do already hate God. But anyway, they'd hate God real bad. The man of God said, is Jezebel up there? Yeah. Throw her out of the window. That's a big smile. <laughs> Throw her out of the window. Some people in this room have people who are evil and wicked and non-producing and non-productive in your life, and you need to throw them out the window. You just need to be willing to say, I'm not walking this road with you this way anymore. I love you. Mom, I'm not talking about you, praise God. I love you, but I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm tossing you out the window. Now, you can change, or you can become dog poop. It's up to you. Whatever you want. I don't know about that church. They talk about dog poop a lot. Are you getting anything out of this? Yes. Am, am I helping you? Yes. I, don't mind if, I don't mind if I'm making you mad, but I want to make you mad and help. I don't want to just make you mad. So tomorrow, you got a choice. 
When I was a kid in junior high school, in elementary school, mom and dad, plug your ears. What I'm about to say doesn't concern you. <laughs> I was um, what they would call naughty. <laughs> a bit. And uh, I won't get into all the stuff that I did because I don't want to incite a riot. Their teachers here, especially, they'll be so mad at me. But I wasn't nice in school. I know that's probably hard for you to believe. But but I remember one day I was getting ready to go to school, and it was the first day of the year, right? And uh, I was one of those kids that never really liked to have my picture taken. I'm still one of those kids. And... Uh, Remember, we were outside. My brother Jeff is here. My, he's my middle brother. I'm the youngest. I'm the baby. And uh, my oldest brother, Aaron, and Jeff and I, I think we went down maybe by the mailbox or something because there's a brick retaining wall that Justin Ozanich built like Nehemiah and uh, for mom and dad a long time ago, and it still stands. You need a wall built? Call Justin. Anyway, I remember being down there by the... You remember that picture, Mom? Uh-huh. We got our picture taken, and then we walked back up, up the driveway into the house, and Mom made a statement to me. She said, you know, each day of this school year can just be a brick. And you can just take one day at a time and not be a jackass, is what she was wanting to say, but she didn't say that. But not be a mule, not be stubborn, not be a fool, not be an embarrassment to us, is really what she meant as well. Uh, and you can build a wall. And at the end of the school year, you can look back and you can see, man, I did it. And she told me, because she knew who I was. She said, you're probably going to have days where that brick will have to be taken out. We can't keep going up with that day in there. But just think about each day of this year, building a wall. And for us, tomorrow is a brick. You say, man, I am so tired, I'm so sick and tired, I'm so fed up, I, I just, I can't even anymore with this. Well, tomorrow is a new day. Amen. And it doesn't matter if there's nothing left standing. And also, it doesn't matter if that's your fault. Who cares? Start tomorrow and put one brick down. And I'd encourage you, don't lie. Don't cheat yourself. If you didn't maintain the excellent spirit, the right heart, or the right attitude that you feel right now in this moment, because you're the only person who can take inventory of your heart and your thoughts. So you know. I don't need to know. Your neighbor doesn't need to know. The other person, front, back, behind, side, whatever, they don't need to know. If you can say, tomorrow, I did good. I, d I maintained the right... My boss came in first thing in the morning, and I thought for sure it was the devil. And so I just shut my mouth. And the devil wears Prada or something like that. And I thought for sure that you'd come to stir me up this morning. I haven't even had my coffee. Or maybe it starts before then. It's your kids. And they're going, mom, 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 mom. Or they don't say dad. That's probably, they know the difference. I love you, kid. I'll buy you stuff. I don't take care of that. Anyway, moving right along. That's how to be a real man of God. But if you maintain the right attitude and heart that you're looking for, every person in this room is different. I don't know how many people there are, 100, 115 people or whatever. It's all different. But if you can say at the end of the day when you're getting ready to put your head on the pillow, I won today. In this area, it was just working me over, and I mean the devil was hitting me in the body, and he was taking headshots at me, and I didn't lose my peace, or I didn't blow up, or I didn't... And put a brick down. 
You know why God always told his people wherever they went and whatever they did? Set a memorial here. You know why? It's no different than putting a brick in a wall. Put a stack of stones here after you cross over the Jordan. So that way anyone who ever comes back to this place can look at that stack of stones and they'll say, pulling on your robe. Daddy, what is this? When you go into a, a new land, God would instruct them, build an altar for me. Worship me. Praise me. Why? Because someday, it's all good today, but maybe next month that isn't going to be. And that altar, that memorial, that stack of stones, that brick in the wall, you can go back. When the enemy's trying to convince you that you're a no good, filthy nothing, you can go back and say, no, I got a whole partially built wall here of all the days where I maintained an excellent spirit. I have a partially built wall here of all the days I kept my peace and shut my mouth. I have a partially built wall here when I didn't do that or look at that or touch that or drink that or smoke that or think that. Or I have a partially built wall here where I can look back and say this is a memorial. God is working in my life. And not only is he doing good, but I'm doing good. There's change in me. Wow, this wall isn't just one brick anymore. It's like 400 bricks. And my Lord, if I keep going, I'm going to build a whole house. And that's the whole point. We are being built up a spiritual dwelling place for God. That's the whole point. We are the edifice. It's our life. An excellent spirit doesn't just throw in the towel. Now, there are many of you in this room that you are absolute warriors, and you deserve to have your feet washed, and you deserve to be saluted and honored because you've stood in and stood in and stood in and you've been taken advantage of and you've been lied about and you've been lied to and you've been mistreated and you've been abused and you didn't quit and i applaud you and i salute you and i say don't stop persevere what are you believing god for don't give up don't quit just keep going just keep moving one thing i say to people i'm gonna didn't even read a bible verse I'll never go to that church again. <laughs> I didn't even read a Bible verse. I did. You want me to preach again? I can do another 40 minutes. I can start reading Bible verses if you want. Who here thinks I could go another 40 minutes? Just wanted to make sure. This was just the introduction. I don't know what happened to all my time. I say this to people often, and then I'll, I'll close. Emily, will you want to go play some music? I don't know why it just feels right. Often, people are in the middle of the storm. The, the waters are rising, and they're raging. The fire is getting more and more intense. The blaze of the flames are coming in it feels like the wall whatever analogy you want to use often we'll go through life where things you know jesus said this and, and i'm not rabbit uh trailing for the sake of a rabbit trail i want you to hear this first jesus said this he said the enemy will come in immediately to steal the word and he comes for the sake of the word that was sown You'll leave here today and everything you heard is going to be challenged on purpose, by design, because the devil is a turd. It'll be challenged. You'll get a phone call. You'll read an email, a text message. Someone might not shake your hand and say goodbye to you and bow down and roll the red carpet out because you made it to church. The pastor should go to church. It'll be challenged immediately. And Jesus said that that will come immediately. Say immediately. immediately. How soon is that? Now. Right now. Right now. Anyway, the fire and the flood and the walls and the pressure and the weight and the stress, it at times mounts up. 
it builds and builds and builds and builds and builds and we think, my God, when is this going to end? When will these waters subside? When will these walls stop pressing in on me? When? I mean, can I just get a break? I don't know, there might be some people here who understand that. There might be some people here that are feeling that. And they're thinking, I, I'm, I'm, there. I'm, I'm there, I need that. I need that reprieve, I need that break, I need that respite, I need that ceasefire. And I want to encourage you, if you're in that place, and this is what I say to people many, many, many times over the years, don't try to take any ground. Don't try to advance your cause. When all of hell is legitimately raging against you on purpose, I want to encourage you, just be determined. I, I'm not going to take a step forward, but bless God by my God, I will not be taking any steps back. I'm going to stand right here. In fact, if you want to, just draw a line. See, I'm not coming off this line. Because that's the battle. That's how you win. That's, that's when I'm going to see a victory manifest in your life. I will not be easily moved. Come at me. Throw anything you want at me. Hit me as many times as you want. I might not be moving forward, but I'm not going to go backward. I'm not going to lose any ground I've already taken. And it's in those moments that you just got to anchor. Drop that anchor out and say, I'm not going to be drifted away. I'm not going to be carried away. I'm not going to be moved by this. I'm not going to be pulled off of this. I'm not going to be backed down from this. The prophet Isaiah said this to the people of God, I was done. And then the Lord put a scripture in my heart. So for your benefit, you can't leave and say, I went to church, the preacher preached and didn't even read a Bible verse. Isaiah chapter 43, verse 1, Now thus says the Lord who created you and who formed you, Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name and you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they'll not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned and the flame will not scorch you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel. I am your Savior. Isaiah 41 says, Fear not, neither be dismayed. I'm going to read it. Man, this church is so good. You get two Bible verses. Fear not, I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, he says, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. You might not be in that place this morning. You might not feel the floodwaters. You might not feel the heat of the flame. But it's coming. It'll be there. It might be easy right now. That it's not challenging. It's not difficult. Things seem to be going pretty good for me. Man, rejoice. I said rejoice. Be exceedingly glad. Because there'll be a day when the enemy will come to challenge it. And that's not fear. It's just a fact. He'll come to challenge it. If he did to Jesus, he'll do it to you. But I encourage you and I pray, my prayer this morning is that the Spirit of God will remind you of these words. Not the words of Pastor Brian, but the words of God and His Holy Word. You will pass through the waters. The rivers may rise, but they will not overflow you. You'll walk through the fire and it will not burn you. It will not scorch you. And then just say, determine. I'm not going to lose ground. I'm not going to step back. I'm going to maintain a right heart and an excellent spirit. I'm going to build a wall. 
and I'll be able to see my progress and my growth. And there'll be times I'm going to look at that wall and there'll be a fractured brick and I'll realize and remember that was the day I didn't do so good. So what do we do? We just simply repent. That's how we take that brick out. What does repent mean? It's not a swear word. It's not a bad word. The word repent doesn't mean beg and plead. God, please forgive me. I'm so unholy and so unworthy. I don't know why you love me. I'm so terrible. No, the word repent means change your mind, change your heart, and then change your direction and walk away from that. Repent is really good. So if you look at your wall and you say, boy, that one isn't quite right. I was like 90% good, but there was a part of me that was really not good. You know the difference. No one's judging you, but you. You ought to judge, by, this, by the way, yourself. And I said, we're going to get that one out. Let's just ask God to forgive us. Amen. Don't lose ground. If you're in the battle, we're standing with you. You're not alone. If you're in the fire, just like with the boys in the book of Daniel, there's a fourth one in there. They can put it up 10 times hotter than kill the guy and it doesn't matter. Amen. Just keep standing. Does that help you today? Yeah. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your love. There are people today that are hearing sermons that you're mad at them and angry with them and they shouldn't expect anything from you because you're holy and we're not. But today, Father, I thank you for this message and this word that you're good and you're kind and you're compassionate and you're caring and you're loving and you're merciful and you're demonstrating and you're long-suffering with us. Your mercies are new to us every morning. No matter what we have done, you will always ever be the faithful God. You're the faithful God who keeps covenant. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for caring about us. I'm going to take a moment and give you an opportunity today. If you're here today and you say, you know, I've walked with God, loved God, stuff has happened in my life and I've just been taxed. In fact, preacher, I'm weary. 